and another word of welcome to those that are going to be joining us either uh, virtually at another time or that'll be scrolling through Springbank's webpage and uh, come across this, uh, this piece. My name is uh, Michael Bechart, and uh, one of the hats that I wear is that I'm the chair of the Diocesan Ecumenical Commission. It's a uh, very small group, and uh, like many other groups in the diocese in our country, it's uh, suffered the rages of COVID, and we have yet to kind of get back together and um, pull together another roster of events to help form the people of God in the Diocese of London. Very grateful today that uh, Father Martin Brown is uh, joining us from, uh, from St. Peter's in Rome. A little bit about uh, Father Martin and uh, where I first met him. As many of you know, I, uh, I make my annual retreat every year at Glenstall Abbey. It's a Benedictine community outside of the village of Maru and uh, County Limerick in Ireland. It's uh, one of these places that has been touched by God. And it's always been um, a real gift to join the, uh, the monks in prayer and in celebration. Tremendous gift of hospitality, great outreach into the community, and they run a wonderful little operation. Um, I first met Martin there when he was not yet ordained. So Father Martin Brown uh, made his first profession with the Glenstall community in September of 2002 and his solemn profession in July of 2005. He was ordained a deacon for the community in 2008 and then he received presbyteral ordination in May of 2015. Um, Martin's education is taking place at uh, Trinity College in Dublin and also at St. John's College in Durham. And if I was to begin to go through uh, a list of the things that he's been involved with inside and outside of the community, we would be here for the next several hours. Uh, suffice to say, Martin's been um, actively engaged in um, the administration and education of young people at uh, the Glenstall Abbey School, uh, which is, I think, the leading school right now, if not the first, the second in, uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, Martin has been engaged in um, countless different ecumenical um, activities, uh, writings, um, program development, uh, not only in his community, but also beyond that. In addition to all this good work, uh, he has been involved in not only editing books, but in contributing chapters and a number of articles. Now, I say all this, but I think what I really appreciate is uh, is the wisdom and insight that uh, Father Martin brings today. I've uh, had the great pleasure not only of hearing him preach in person at the uh, community's masses, but I've also had the opportunity to follow Glenstall Abbey online and I've uh, had the opportunity to hear Martin speak there as well. Um, wonderful content, uh, stirs my heart, and I think uh, forms me in the gospel. So Father Martin, we're very grateful that you are coming today uh, to us from your new position in Rome, where you are engaged with the, um, I think it's called the Dicastri now for, yeah, yeah. the Dicastri for relations between Christians. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about it as we go along, yeah. Okay, but anyway, we're very grateful for you, uh, your presence here today, we're grateful for your time, and uh, we look forward to all that you have to offer. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I hope that my, uh, AirPods are working and that I can be heard. Um, so thank you, uh, Father Michael, for your invitation and for uh, that <laughs> slightly daunting build-up. Uh, it, it is very uh, good to be with you. Uh, I do say that I find the task today slightly daunting um, because this is the first time that I've given this kind of talk. Um, I started in our office in Rome at the end of September last. And so even though I, I may be used to speaking in public a lot, all manner of things. Uh, the idea of speaking as a, as a Vatican official uh, is a very new one indeed. And the uh, added complication of doing it all online with the potential for the Wi-Fi or the slides or the microphones or something to go wrong uh, makes it all a little bit more scary. But I trust that you'll be suitably understanding if there are problems. And I know that uh, Beth is standing by to fix anything that goes uh, that may go wrong. Michael suggested the intriguing title, The Time Is Now, for today's session. I agreed to that title a month or two ago, but of course, more recently when I began to actually write, I found myself regretting that it wasn't a bit more specific 
or even a bit more blunt and wondering who on earth agreed and signed off on such a mysterious uh, and slightly vague title. Uh, well, it was me, I signed off on it. Uh, but there is, of course, a reason for having this pressing call to embrace the present moment as our title. And that is that Christian unity is not something that it might be nice to think about at some point, vague point in the future. There is an urgency about it, both in terms of evangelistic or missional credibility for the Christian church as a whole, and at an even more profound level, in terms of our fidelity to the desire and the prayer of our Lord that all may be one. So no matter how little it may seem to be a priority in some quarters, or no matter uh, how remote the possibility of actually achieving it may seem, the quest for unity among Christian believers, the unity of the members of Christ's body, should never be and can never be an add-on or an optional extra in our lives as Catholic Christians. So the time is indeed now. And during this talk, I would like to help us come to a deeper consciousness uh, of this urgency. I'm going to begin sharing my slides, and I hope that works reasonably smoothly. So I hope you're seeing my, my title slide now. Uh, if somebody nods, I'll know that it, is, that it is working. Yeah, I see a thumbs up. This is good. So, uh, so in order to uh, try and lead us into this, uh, I don't want to sit here uh, just exhorting you or berating you, <laughs> although there may be an element of both. I'd like to instead share some stories, some experiences, uh, tell you things that have struck me over the years, things that have happened to me over the years. And so firstly, uh, a bit more about my own commitment and journey in this area, and, and Michael has referred to some of it. And then secondly, after that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Catholic Church's work on an international level since Vatican II, as it seeks unity among Christians. I suspect that many people will be surprised at just how extensive, detailed, and sustained that work is. It's one of the many well-kept secrets uh, in our church. And dare I say it, it can be quite an inspiring one. I know that sometimes Rome, uh, with that word sort of in, in, in quotation marks, uh, can sometimes be seen in the popular imagination as a kind of controlling bogeyman stifling the energy of Catholics on the ground around the world. But in the ecumenical sphere, you might be actually pleasantly surprised at how active and engaged that Rome has been and continues to be. First, a bit about myself. As Michael mentioned, I'm a Benedictine monk of Glenstall Abbey in County Limerick in Ireland. That's uh, County Limerick in the darker green in the uh, Midwest of the country. And actually originally from quite near there, County Clare, the county immediately above it, about 40 miles away. I'm not entirely sure where my own interest in ecumenism was born. I, I didn't have any close non-Catholic relatives. Uh, and even though there was a small Anglican church in my town, the town itself and my schools were almost entirely Roman Catholic. And this was at a time when the vast, vast majority of people were still actively involved in their churches. In my primary school, in the entire time that I was there for uh, nine years, I can remember one Protestant student and no Muslims or Jews or Hindus. Uh, it's quite different now, but uh, so I don't have a, I didn't grow up in, in, a, in a, an active and varied uh, ecumenical environment, so I'm not quite sure where it came out of. I went to university in Trinity College in Dublin, and there I began attending regularly Anglican choral evensong, evening prayer, in the college chapel. I've always been involved in, in church music and choirs in uh, one way or another, and the music of the Taizé community in France, uh, I've known about it since I was a child. I occasionally attended ecumenical Taizé prayer services in the college chapel uh, uh, in Dublin when I was a student but it was nearly 10 years later before I eventually got to visit Teze in person. And I have visited there four times uh, since then, uh, each time for a week at a time. Meanwhile, while still in college, uh, through weekend involvement in local radio, I learned about an annual 
ecumenical conference in that place called Glenstall Abbey that wasn't terribly far away. And so I attended it several times with a heavy old tape recorder and microphone in tow. And so in fact, uh, ecumenism was one of the ways that I got to know the community that I eventually joined. I interviewed many interesting people uh, from Ireland and beyond during those conferences. I remember a particularly memorable, interesting, but often impenetrable interview uh, with the great Canadian Dominican priest and ecumenist, Père Jean Thiers. Thiers was a great man uh, and has left a huge legacy to uh, the world of ecclesiology and, ecum and ecumenism, uh, but he didn't speak very well, it was very good English. Uh, so interview uh, was a little bit uh, trying. It's a pity that one can't have subtitles on the radio. Uh, during my second visit to Teze in August 2000, again with audio equipment in hand, although it was slightly more modern, smaller and lighter on this occasion, 60 years to the day since the foundation of the community, I managed to do a radio interview with the founder, the inspirational brother Roger, Frère Roger Schutz. I actually hadn't been warned in advance that he would be answering the questions that I was asking. He would actually answer them in French. Um, and radio stations in rural Ireland didn't have dubbing departments, but we, we managed to make it work afterwards. Uh, and it was an amazing experience, uh, not, not just for the content of the interview, which was interesting, uh, but for the very uh, profound spiritual experience I had uh, doing it uh, and in the immediate aftermath. Because um, uh, when the interview was over and uh, his assistants were uh, preparing to usher me out, uh, Brother Roger insisted, in taking some time in the corner of his room in front of an icon, praying with me, and in fact praying for me and uh, using some of the uh, young, young person existential angst type questions from my interview, sensing correctly that they weren't just uh, interview questions, but that they were reflecting some of my own questions. And he took time to, to pray through those questions and, and, and use them to pray very beautifully for me. Uh, it was quite an experience and a real privilege. A year later, I entered the novitiate of Glenstall Abbey, and uh, these uh, two events are not unrelated, but uh, that's a story for another time. In time, I was to serve as secretary and later chairman of that self-same Glenstall Ecumenical Conference, uh, through which I had got to know the place uh, originally. Sadly, that gathering has since been discontinued. So as you can see, therefore, in strange ways known only to God's providence, uh, ecumenical work and prayer have been intimately entwined in the story of my own life and my own vocation. When the time came to go away from the monastery for a few years of theological study, uh, I somewhat eccentrically asked uh, if I might study in the company of brothers and sisters from a different Christian tradition. And after another set of unusual circumstances and a couple of happy accidents, I found myself in Cranmer Hall, you can't get a more Protestant sounding name than Cranmer Hall in St. John's College in Durham in the northeast of England. And that's uh, where Durham is, it's uh, quite near Scotland. And as you can see, it is the most stunningly beautiful place uh, on the bank of the cathedral there on the banks of the river. I found myself there living, praying and studying alongside men and women who were training for ordained ministry in the Church of England and in the Methodist Church. They were predominantly evangelical, many coming from charismatic churches, which though officially Anglican, had very informal and often quite unliturgical uh, styles of worship that were a long way from the stately Anglican choral tradition that I had come to, to love uh, in college in Dublin. I had very little uh, experience or understanding uh, of such Christians. Mind you, they had even less uh, experience or understanding of Catholics and particularly of monks. So it was certainly an interesting time for all of us. I saw myself very much as an ecumenical pilgrim in Durham, and it was a place uh, with a wonderful Benedictine heritage. That uh, amazing cathedral was originally uh, a Benedictine uh, cathedral priory, and it still houses the tombs both of St. Cuthbert and of St. Bede the Venerable. Uh, they somehow weren't uh, destroyed uh, by King Henry's commissioners uh, during the uh, Reformation, and they are still very much part of the spiritual life 
of, of that part of, of, of England. Back home after this ecumenical adventure, while working in administration in our school, I became involved at, on the side as a sort of a hobby uh, with fellow Benedictines and others in overseeing an ecumenical journal called One in Christ. And uh, as Michael said, I, I produced some articles for it over the years, but most of my work uh, was via the editorial board uh, suggesting and sourcing articles for it. So you can see again that uh, ecumenical engagement has been a permanent feature of my life since I joined the monastery more than 20 years ago, sometimes in the foreground of that, sometimes in the background, but certainly always there. And so while it is a bit unusual for a Benedictine monk to have a job that involves living outside his monastery, uh, you'll appreciate how excited and blessed I felt when the opportunity arose to come to Rome to work in the dicastery for promoting Christian unity here. And I remain hugely grateful uh, to have been offered this opportunity and to have been released indeed by my abbot in order to be able to accept it. So, what on earth is the dicastery for promoting Christian unity? Well, the word dicastery comes from the Greek for a law court, uh, but as used in, in, the, in the Curia in Rome, it basically corresponds to a government department or, or ministry. It's, it's the Vatican's department for ecumenism. The name has evolved over the years, reflecting the changing understanding and interestingly, the changing priority of ecumenical work in Rome. The origin of the Dicastery for Promoting Christian Unity is closely linked with the Second Vatican Council, uh, which took place in the mid-1960s, as you probably know. It was Pope John XXIII's uh, desire that the Catholic Church's involvement in the ecumenical movement be one of the Council's chief concerns, and that one of the Council's uh, primary objectives would be uh, work towards uh, reuniting uh, Christians. Now, this may seem like a pretty unremarkable and entirely natural priority uh, for, the, for a council um, as we look back from our point in history. But it was not always thus. Just a few decades before the council, uh, in his encyclical Mortalium Animos uh, of 1928, Pope Pius XI made it very clear that the Catholic Church would have and wanted to have nothing to do with any kind of ecumenical movement. And some of what Pope Pius wrote in this letter really was extraordinary. And it's, it, it feels very strange to read it nowadays. He feared the kind of indifferentism that can blur distinctions. And that's a, certainly a legitimate concern. But in criticizing the potential for uh, reducing everything to the lowest common denominator and, and uh, the indifferentism, uh, he was really utterly dismissive uh, of the reasons that were being cited at the time in support of the quest for Christian unity. Is it not right, it is often repeated, indeed even consonant with duty, that all who invoke the name of Christ should abstain from mutual reproaches and at long last be united in mutual charity? Who would dare to say that he loved Christ unless he worked with all his might to carry out the desires of him who asked his father that his disciples might be one. And did not the same Christ will that his disciples should be marked out and distinguished from others by this characteristic, namely that they loved one another. All Christians, they add, should be as one, for then they would be much more powerful in driving out the pest of irreligion, which like a serpent daily creeps further and becomes more widely spread and prepares to rob the gospel of its strength. The weird thing, as we look back at that now, is that these are precisely the reasons why the church nowadays calls us to care about, pray for, and work towards Christian unity. Uh, that desire uh, to be one, to be faithful to the Lord's uh, prayer that we be one, and to give common witness that we uh, would not uh, allowing the, the pest of irreligion, as he called it. So these are exactly the reasons that we now cite for doing ecumenical work, uh, but then he was using these, he was just utterly dismissive of them. It was a shrill and uncompromising denunciation of the emerging ecumenical movement. So withering that in places it's really almost sarcastic. And his message at the end to those 
who later came to be known in uh, Vatican parlance as our separated brethren, and brethren includes uh, uh, women, obviously, in this case, um, his message was clear. The union of Christians can only be promoted by promoting the return to the one true church of Christ of those who are separated from it, for in the past they have unhappily left it. So basically, if you care about Christian unity, come back, because you left it. Now, people left it in the 16th century. Uh, somebody who was born uh, the same year he wrote this document never, uh, and was born a Protestant or born Orthodox did not leave the Catholic Church, but there you are. Pope John XXIII, some years later, clearly had a different view. And so he established what was called then the Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity in 1960 as one of the preparatory commissions for the Second Vatican Council. And this marked the beginning of the Catholic Church's formal commitment and involvement in the ecumenical movement. But clearly, a lot had changed since uh, 1928. One of the first officials of the Secretariat, a Paulist priest from America called Tom Stransky, he's the one on the right of this picture here with the sort of round glasses, has written a wonderful account of the early days of the Secretariat, and some of it actually was quite hilarious. They were tucked away in a building that was meant for residential uh, rather than administrative work, and so they didn't have proper uh, staffing, uh, they didn't have proper offices, and so they ended up doing things like storing all their documents in the back. At first, the main function of the Secretariat was simply to invite and look after uh, representatives of the other churches and world communions, to invite them to send observers to the Second Vatican Council. And there you see some of those uh, Protestant observers who attended the council uh, in, the, in the tribunes in St. Peter's. But interestingly, uh, in the first weeks of the council, John XXIII sort of upgraded this Secretariat. He put it on an equal footing with the other conciliar commissions. And this was significant because it changed them from being largely a sort of a, a hospitality office, uh, looking after visits for visitors from other churches, to actually participating in the preparation of the council's documents. And so this secretariat thus prepared and presented to the council the documents on ecumenism, uh, on some on non-Christian religions, religious liberty, and contributed to some of the other ones, including the Constitution on Divine Revelation. So that's a bit of a history lesson, and I hope it isn't too tedious. In terms of a vision that we might try to lay hold of today, the Council's document on ecumenism, Unitatis Radiant Integratio, promulgated in November 1964, is of crucial importance. And uh, like most Roman documents, the title is simply the opening words of the document itself, Unitatis Radiant Integratio, the restoration of unity. The document's opening words provide a pretty straightforward statement of why we engage in ecumenical work. And they haven't lost any of their relevance. I do need to apologize uh, before this quotation and all the other ones. From, um, the language is entirely uh, not inclusive and can, uh, jars somewhat, but um, uh, that, that's what was in the official English translation. The restoration of unity among all Christians is one of the principal concerns of the Second Vatican Council. 1928, we were dismissive of it. Now a church council is saying it's one of the principal concerns of the council. Christ the Lord founded one church and one church only. However, Christian communions present themselves to men as the true inheritors of Jesus Christ. All indeed profess to be followers of the Lord, but differ in mind and go their different ways as if Christ himself were divided. Such division openly contradicts the will of Christ, scandalizes the world, and damages the holy cause of preaching the gospel to every creature. That's a very powerful sort of manifesto uh, for ecumenical activity, because division openly contradicts the will of Christ, scandalizes the world, and damages the holy cause of preaching the gospel to every creature. So that new tone is striking when you, when you compare it with what uh, uh, Pius XI was saying some years previously. Instead of a sour dismissal of ecumenical impulses, both inside and outside the visible bounds of the church, the council instead saw these impulses as responses to God's prompting. Uh, so they weren't to be sneezed and, and, and sneered at, uh, they were actually 
signs of the work of the Holy Spirit. That's really important. It goes on, it says, in recent times, more than ever before, he has been rousing the divide, divided Christians to remorse over their divisions and to a longing for unity. I love that, remorse, the division, and longing for unity. This is, this is really uh, visceral. The, the, the need for Christian unity is something we feel. It's not an intellectual uh, decision of the will. Everywhere, large numbers have felt the impulse of this grace. And among our separated brethren, also, there increases from day to day the movement fostered by the grace of the Holy Spirit for the restoration of unity among all Christians. All, however, though in different ways, long for the one visible church of God, a church truly universal and set forth into the world that the world may be converted to the gospel and so be saved to the glory of God. This last part, of course, is key. The search for unity is never about unity as a purely horizontal human togetherness. They're nice things, but that's not what Christian unity is about. It's not about unity uh, for warm, fuzzy feelings. It's about unity for the sake of the kingdom, that the world may be converted to the gospel and so be saved. So gone were the polemical assertions that all those separated from Rome had unhappily left the church, as Pius had put it and that blame for division all lay on one side. Instead, there was a candid recognition that the story is a lot more complicated. Again, apologizing for the uh, very exclusive language, I share this paragraph, which I find very moving. In subsequent centuries, much more serious dissensions made their appearance, and quite large communities came to be separated from full communion with the Catholic Church, for which, often enough, men of both sides were to blame. The children who are born into these communities and who grow up believing in Christ cannot be accused of the sin involved in the separation, and the Catholic Church embraces them as brothers with respect and affection. For men who believe in Christ and have been truly baptized are in communion with the Catholic Church, even though this communion is imperfect. So on one level, it's a very simple and a very logical statement that people born today cannot be blamed for splits that happened 500 years ago or 1,000 years ago, or in the case of the Assyrian Church of the East, 1,500 years ago, despite what had been said in 1928. But it wasn't long before that that the Church, as I say, acted as if they should actually be blamed uh, for the sins of their great-great-grandfathers going back for centuries. And neither was the Council document a patronizing it's not your fault that you were born a Protestant, a sort of fake pity. Instead, it's a warm, affirming embrace, a fraternal embrace, and a recognition that though we are not in full communion with the other churches and communities, we are in communion with them, albeit in perfect communion. This was a giant leap. Obstacles, huge obstacles remained, but Unitatis Red Integratio far from denouncing the ecumenical movement as the kind of soup of indifferentism that Pius XI was denouncing, actually saw the ecumenical movement in unquestioningly positive terms. The ecumenical movement is striving to overcome these obstacles, but even in spite of them, it remains true that all who have been justified by faith in baptism are members of Christ's body and have a right to be called Christian, and so are correctly accepted as brothers by the children of the Catholic Church. I find these words from nearly 60 years ago incredibly beautiful. And on rough days in the office, when we seem to be taking uh, two steps backwards for every one step forwards, I also find them very consoling. And though this all showed a new attitude to ecumenism, it's also important to point out that the council didn't just sort of roll over and dump all of the church's teachings and principles in the interest of saying nice things about those who were separated from the Catholic Church. It judged that other Christian communities lacked the gift of unity that comes from belonging to the Catholic Church, and as such saw them as, and the word it uses is, deficient, language which surely must irritate some. Nevertheless, though seeing them as deficient in certain ways, it stressed that the Spirit of Christ has not refrained from using them as means of salvation 
which derive their efficacy from the very fullness of grace and truth entrusted to the church. Unitatis Red Integratio recognized the churches of the East as true sister churches uh, in the technical sense of church, real churches with real ministry and real sacraments. Its position on the West was somewhat less fulsome, saying that they have not retained the proper reality of the Eucharistic mystery in its fullness, especially because of the absence of the sacrament of orders. Now, this isn't the time to unpack that statement thoroughly, or we'd be here for hours. It refers to a whole swathe of Christians, from Anglicans to Quakers, and a lot in between, some of whom would have no problem with it at all, and some of whom would find it troubling, unnuanced, or even offensive. And though we might want to state it in more nuanced terms nowadays, thanks to the progress that has been made in ecumenical dialogues over the past 60 years, uh, that understanding presented uh, in Unitatis Red Integratio is substantially what pertains today too, and it has been the subject of much theological work in several of the bilateral dialogues since then. So you might be tempted to ask, how on earth could I sit here and possibly see great progress in a document that makes such harsh judgments about brothers and sisters in Christ? I think that the positive side is that Vatican II, while recognizing the major dividing issues and the difficulty of resolving them, did so in a way that was built on the love and respect that comes from recognizing the other as a beloved sibling in Christ, washed clean in the same waters and so part of the same body. It didn't seek to use this uh, negative assessment of the other church's ecclesiality as an excuse to dismiss them or to walk away from them or as a stick with which to beat them into submission to Rome. It admitted the problem, but sought to work together with these separated brethren to address it. So though apparently harsh to our ears, it came from a much more generous place than many previous declarations. Even in this case, it sought to recognize and affirm what it could see as good and fruitful in Protestant celebrations of Holy Communion, for instance, even if it couldn't affirm that the Protestant churches had retained the proper reality of the Eucharistic mystery in its fullness. Uh, echoing St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, it recognized some of the anamnetic and eschatological dimensions of value in Protestant celebrations. When they commemorate his death and resurrection in the Lord's Supper, they profess that it signifies life in communion with Christ and look forward to his coming in glory. Therefore, the teaching concerning the Lord's Supper, the other sacraments, worship, the ministry of the church must be the subject of the dialogue. And I, in my slide there, you'll see put the words dialogue uh, in red uh, because uh, that's what kicked off after Vatican II. Uh, and that's what's very much at the heart of the work of our office in Rome now. It didn't just make a negative appraisal and leave it sitting there like a steaming, you know what. It went on to say that all of this meant that sacraments, worship, and the ministry of the church needed to be the subject of the ecumenical dialogue. And they have been. In 1963, even before that conciliar document on ecumenism, the Pope specified that the Secretariat would be made up of two sections, dealing respectively with the Orthodox churches and uh, Oriental churches on the one hand, and with the Western churches and ecclesial communities on the other. And that's the way things remain today. Apart from the superiors and support staff, in the Eastern section, there is one official responsible for the Greek-speaking Orthodox churches, one responsible for the Slavic Orthodox churches, one for the Oriental Orthodox churches, that's the Syriac, Coptic, and Armenians, and so on. And then in the Western section, there is one official dealing with Anglicans and Methodists, and that would be me, one official dealing with Lutherans and Old Catholics, one for the Reformed, the Baptists, and other historic Protestant churches, one for Pentecostals and Evangelicals and non-denominational Christians, and one for relations with multilateral bodies such as the World Council of Churches. I think some people might be surprised to, to realize that the Catholic Church has formal connections, particularly with uh, those new Pentecostal and non Evangelical and non-denominational Christians. Um, the mandate to do what is possible to create unity among Christians is taken very seriously. Uh, and that means you can't just 
uh, choose who you talk to and decide you're only going to talk to people that you, you like the look of, as it were. Though set up as a resource for Vatican II itself, in 1966, after the Council had ended, Pope Paul VI confirmed that this Secretariat for Promoting Christian Unity uh, would now be a permanent organ of the Holy See. And that's significant. It's uh, evidence of the increasing significance of ecumenism in the life of the Church. So what started out as little more than a sort of a hospitality desk, a sort of ecclesiastical travel agency, uh, went on uh, to become involved in drafting council documents, and now it was taking its place permanently in the central administration of the Catholic Church. In 1988, Pope John Paul II changed its name to the Pontifical Council for promoting Christian unity, again giving it greater significance. And then last year in his new constitution for the uh, Roman Curia, Predicata Evangelium, Pope Francis renamed it the Dicastery for Promoting Christian Unity. And while that word Dicastery is not the most beautiful of words in English, it is noteworthy that all of, now, of the principal departments of the Roman Curia are now called Dicasteries. In the past, there was a hierarchy uh, and mere pontifical councils ranked below congregations, like the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and the Congregation for Bishops, the Congregation of the Clergy, the abolition of that distinction now gives the church's ecumenical work greater uh, centrality and esteem and parity uh, with the other organs of the Holy See. Uh, that might be a footnote for most people, uh, but believe me, it's not without significance here in Rome. Pardon me. The Dicastery has two main roles. First of all, it's entrusted with the promotion of ecumenism within the Catholic Church. Unitatis Red Integratio is in many ways the charter for this, as, as I've been saying uh, in the last uh, few, few minutes. To assist in this work, an ecumenical directory was published in the late 1960s with a revised edition in 1993, the Directory for the Application and Principles and Norms on Ecumenism. Various related documents have been issued since then, including in 2020, a guide for bishops to encourage them in their ecumenical ministry to sort of summarize a lot of the work that has happened over the last 60 years and to put it all in a, a slim volume that the bishop might actually have time to read and uh, use uh, with his collaborators in the uh, planning of the ministry and structuring of the ministry in the diocese. It's a simple book called The Bishop and Christian Unity, an Ecumenical Vade Mecum. The most recent document of note for use inside the Catholic Church was a working paper produced in 2022 entitled Ecumenism in a Time of Pandemic, From Crisis to Opportunity. I have to admit that I'm not in the job long enough to have a clear sense of how well our dicastery's efforts at promoting an authentic ecumenical spirit, which is what our job description says, within the Catholic Church actually works in practice. Like anybody, I guess, with an advocacy role within an organization, and that's not the language we would use to describe uh, our office, but in fact, uh, it, it, that is what it is. In, inside the church, a lot of our work uh, is ad advocacy, trying to keep uh, ecumenism alive, to keep the significance and centrality of ecumenism uh, before people's eyes uh, within, within the church, particularly before the eyes of bishops. And so we do our best, and say, like anyone in any kind of ad advocacy role in an organization, we just keep plugging at it, meeting bishops when they visit Rome, encouraging bishops' conferences, providing advice and support in every way we can, which is why we accept invitations like the one I received uh, today to, to, to give this talk for the Diocese of London. And the second part of the Dicastery's work role uh, is to work in any way we can to promote Christian unity by strengthening relationships with other churches and ecclesial communities. And there are a couple of different dimensions to this. Some are explicitly theological working together in dialogue commissions or other forms of official engagement with pastors and theologians that are mandated by both sides, if you want to use the language of sides, uh, re resulting in formal reports or agreed statements being published afterwards. Uh, so there I just put four relatively recent photographs uh, that show the variety of those dialogues. Uh, the one on the top left uh, took place in our offices and it was with uh, the United Bible Societies of the World. So that's an informal conversation, uh, whereas the one below it uh, was in India with uh, the Melanchra Orthodox, and I won't say which one because I'm not sure because there are 
three churches that use the word Malanka or Orthodox, and I get confused. Um, the very grand looking one in the top right uh, is our recent dialogue with the Oriental Orthodox churches. Uh, and bottom right uh, is most recent meeting of ARCHIC, the Anglican Roman Catholic Commission. And I put that in largely because uh, the Anglican co-chair for that meeting uh, was Archbishop Linda Nichols, uh, the Anglican Primate of Canada, and I think a former Bishop of Huron, which may be your corresponding diocese, I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm sure she's known in your part of the world, uh, and uh, we have worked well with her uh, over the last number of years. Some other elements uh, of our work, besides these formal uh, dialogues, are much more human and personal simply being kind to one another, visiting one another, exchanging greetings for the great feasts of the year, and so on, as siblings do. Our dicastery has the task of appointing official Catholic observers to various ecumenical gatherings and to the key meetings of the various churches with whom we are in relationship, and in turn to invite observers or fraternal delegates of these other churches and ecclesial communities to major events of the Catholic Church, such as synods. So again, looking at the pictures that I uh, put on the screen this time, the top left was very recently, you can see it's in Rome, uh, a study visit by a group of uh, young, well, you can see there's one or two old people in the middle, but they live in Rome. But the young people around them, young Oriental Orthodox priests and monks uh, had a week, a study week, week in Rome hosted by us to learn more about the Catholic Church and they had an extraordinary week uh, meeting, meeting the Pope, but also meeting people in, in various dicasteries and in various of the Roman universities. Uh, they, they, they were with us uh, in, on the Chalian and the um, Aventine Hill with the Pope on, on, on Ash Wednesday. So they come every year. Well, not those people, but a different group of people come every year. Uh, underneath, you have a meeting at the Lambeth Conference, which is the great 10 yearly meeting of all the Anglican bishops of the world. Uh, and that took place in London, the other London, the bigger London, uh, well, near London and also in, in Canterbury itself uh, last summer. So in the picture, you can see the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, the Secretary of our Dicastery, Bishop Brian Farrell, and my predecessor in this role, uh, Father Tony Currer. Top of the screen, uh, every year in the, in the uh, month of January, just before the during the week of prayer for Christian unity, coinciding with the feast of St. Henrik, uh, a delegation comes to Rome from Finland. And you can see there a Lutheran bishop from Finland uh, presenting a book to Pope Francis. Uh, on the right, you have uh, some Serbian Orthodox priests who came to, who came to Rome and brought the Pope a present. Uh, and a rather uh, extraordinary picture there in the middle that I couldn't resist sharing with you. Um, the Anglican Consultative Council uh, met in Ghana, in Accra, uh, a few weeks ago. And of course, uh, Catholics and Anglicans do not share at the altar. So at the end of the closing service, Archbishop Welby, when he was walking down the aisle, stopped in front of me, blessed me, and then took off his mitre, bowed his head, and asked me to bless him, which is what you see in that picture there. So that's the other part of it. There's the dialogues, and then there's the visits and the hospitality. I can't resist sharing another story with you. Early this morning, I accompanied a uh, former moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, that's the Presbyterian Church, to the weekly general audience with the Pope in St. Peter's Square, and afterwards had the chance to introduce him and his wife to Pope Francis. Now, Church of Scotland moderators serve for only one year, but, and they normally do come and visit the Pope during that year. You might have seen that the current moderator visited South Sudan with the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, some weeks ago was uh, this man was 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 moderator in 2020, and he had an appointment and tickets booked to come and visit the Pope, and he had a gift bought for the Pope, but of course COVID struck, and uh, it was cancelled. He's been back in Rome since Christmas, providing temporary cover at the uh, Presbyterian Scottish Presbyterian Church here in Rome, and he'll be here until Easter, and so he asked if he might ha have the chance finally to meet the Pope, albeit. Uh, very briefly and less formally, and then he would uh, be able to give over that gift that he had bought three years ago. And while Presbyterians aren't my responsibility officially, uh, our reformed desk is currently vacant, and so being Anglophone, I have temporarily inherited them. So we arranged it all for last Wednesday. This story is going somewhere, I promise. But unfortunately, the poor man was taken ill at the door of our building. 
literally got came to our building in a taxi and I was going to walk with him up to the audience with his wife and uh, he was in a state of collapse uh, and eventually I ended up accompanying him not to the audience but to the clinic and from there to hospital. He had surgery later that day, was released on Thursday and promptly asked if we could re reschedule the visit to the Pope for this week. So we did. And I'm glad to say that he has finally offloaded those books on the history of Scottish theology that he's been carrying around since 2020. So that picture was uh, lifted off the Vatican News website uh, just uh, an hour ago. So there's a big difference between something like the theological work currently underway in our dialogue with the Anglican Communion on how churches arrive at ethical teaching. That's what we're currently talking about in that commission. There's a big difference between that and presenting a retired Presbyterian minister to the Pope, clearly. But both are parts of my job, and I think both are key dimensions of the work of, of our dicastery because they are key dimensions of the work of ecumenism. Both are necessary. What might be called the dialogue of charity and of life, engaging with one another, getting to know one another, learning to love one another, needs to go alongside the dialogue of truth, where we engage in theological discussion and debate. Sometimes we need to have ecclesiological seminars, and sometimes we need to just drink tea. We get it wrong if the people on the ground think that ecumenism is the business of bishops and theologians only. But we also get it wrong if the theologians and scholars think that ecumenism is only about Christmas carols and coffee and cake, and that can happen. The range of churches and church bodies with which the Catholic Church is in dialogue or conversation, and the different term uh, levels, words are used for the different levels of engagement, the, the range of churches and church bodies uh, that we're involved with through our dicastery is really very extensive. Some of these relationships involve long-standing theological commissions that have produced many important agreements and statements over the years, while some involve at the less formal kinds of engagement I've just been talking about. And there are a lot of them. So, turning first to the Eastern section, with the Orthodox Churches of Byzantine tradition, there is a joint international commission uh, for theological dialogue, and that embraces all of the uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, churches. But then we also have individual links with the churches concerned. The Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople, of course, and then the other historical patriarchates, Alexandria in all Africa, Antioch, Jerusalem, the newer ones led by Moscow, uh, the Serbian Patriarchate, Romania, Bulgaria, Georgia, and then the independent Orthodox churches of Poland, of Cyprus, Greece, Poland, Albania, and the Czech lands. Similarly with the Oriental Orthodox churches, now, I know Eastern, Eastern and Oriental mean the same thing in, in, in English, but by the Oriental churches, we mean uh, those churches, uh, the Armenians, you see them there, the list, Armenians, Ethiopians, and so on, um, whose separation from uh, the Church Catholic dates a long way back, uh, far, further than the, than the Great Eastern Schism or the Reformation, about which I'll say a little bit more in a few moments. So we have uh, formal international dialogue commissions with the Assyrian Church of the East and the Oriental Orthodox family, and that family uh, is embraced by all of uh, these churches listed. The Coptic Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, Armenian Apostolic Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church, the Orthodox Church of Eritre Eritrea, and then as I mentioned earlier, the Malankara Syrian Orthodox Church and the Malankara Orthodox Syrian Church. I know they're the same words in different order, but they are two different churches. And indeed, the possibility of beginning a dialogue with the Malankara Maratoma Syrian Church uh, uh, is being discussed at the moment. And that's a very intriguing body because it is both Oriental and Reformed, and it has a close relationship uh, with the uh, Anglican Communion, as well as being uh, part of the Oriental family. Then moving to the Western section, we have dialogue commissions and other relations with the following bodies. The Old Catholic Bishops uh, Conference of Utrecht, the Anglican Communion, the Lutheran World Federation, the World Methodist Council, World Communion Reform Churches, Baptist World Alliance, Disciples of Christ, and then with Pentecostals, New Charismatics, Evangelicals, Mennonite World Conference, 
and the Salvation Army. That's most, if not all, of the big families of Christian communities uh, in the world. Plus uh, an ongoing and intimate uh, collaboration with the World Council of Churches and the Global Christian Forum. Lots of those newer churches, the Pentecostals and New Charismatics, aren't part of the World Council of Churches because they don't have that sort of official uh, ecclesial structure that would allow them to be part of it. But many of them are part of this looser Global Christian Forum. And so we keep uh, very close relationships with them too. And so the Western section uh, embraces that too, the, the Catholic Church's relations with the World Council of Churches and the Global Christian Forum. Catholic Church isn't a full member of the World Council of Churches, uh, but since 1968, it has been a full member of, that, of the WCC's uh, theological department, the Faith and Order Commission. And we have a, a joint working group with the WCC dealing with many different issues. And then we also collaborate with them separately in the production of the prayers and reflections for the Week of Prayer for Christian Unity every year. So uh, the, the engagement with the World Council of Churches uh, is intense. So I hope you can see that the Catholic Church is in dialogue and conversation with an enormous range of Christian bodies. In some cases, such as with the Assyrian Church of the East, the remaining dividing issues are few, and the prospect of full communion being reestablished is not a pipe dream. With others, particularly newer non-denominational evangelical and Pentecostal churches, the differences in understanding of key things like the church and the sacraments are so great that the nature of the conversations and the desired outcome in the short to medium term, at least, uh, are modest. For instance, an established body like the Salvation Army, for instance, uh, doesn't have the sacrament even of baptism, uh, which might say, well, they're not Christians then, are they? Uh, well, they're certainly a Christian movement, and, and we, we engage with them on their terms as, as a movement of, that is in, deeply involved in prayer and worship, and particularly uh, in service of the poor and needy. And we have very uh, fruitful uh, conversations, conversation being the, the technical term for the kind of meetings we have with them. So uh, the, the variety of bodies that we're involved with uh, is quite significant. With some groups, such as the Anglican Communion, substantial agreements exist on many key issues, and much work has been done on, on sacraments and ministry and so on over the, over the years. But significant division remains on things like who may be admitted to ordained ministry and on clearly uncertain moral questions as we're learning. If you, if you read anything about uh, the life of the ending communion of the world, you know, you know that it's a huge issue uh, within the communion. So we're close to them on some things, uh, but have serious issues on, on other areas. But with them and with all these bodies, we continue to keep the doors of communication open. Clearly, the Catholic Church uh, has huge difficulties with the position being adopted, for instance, uh, by the Moscow, Moscow Patriarchate of, uh, with regard to the, the war uh, in Ukraine at the moment. Uh, and the Pope and various senior Vatican officials have made it clear that they do not accept uh, Moscow's uh, attitude uh, to, to Russian aggression in Ukraine. And that's putting, uh, putting strain on our relationships, putting a strain on Moscow's participation uh, in pan-Orthodox uh, gatherings. But for all that, we do keep the door open. We are still in communication. We don't just speak to groups that look like us, that have lots of bishops who are copes and mitres, or groups that think like us, which is just as well because many of those who look like us often don't think like us, and many of those who think like us don't often look like us. So we speak to as many Christians as we can, even if the goal of full communion in faith, sacraments, and ministry is virtually impossible to envisage. Why? Well, because simply, if we are to be faithful to our Lord, not doing so is not an option. If all this work is so great, why then are we still separated at the altar? Has anything actually been achieved by all these discussions and dialogues? Well, yes, progress is slow, and yes, it is frustrating. But also, yes, much has been achieved. I'd like to mention just one or two things. The first is regarding the Assyrian Church of the East. As I say, a church that has 
been separated from the Catholic Church for a long time. It, it only accepts the first two ecumenical councils, and so has been separated from Rome and indeed from all the other major Eastern churches since the fifth century. A dispute over the nature of Christ and how his humanity related to his divinity. Thanks to years of patient dialogue, Pope John Paul II and the then Catholicos of the Assyrian Church were able to sign a common de Christological declaration in 1994. Without either church having to change its doctrine, they were, thanks to the dialogue, able to put their historic divisions in context. The principal factor that divided them was found to no longer actually be a, a seriously dividing factor, as each came to recognize in their own faith the faith of the other. The statement includes, the controversies of the past led to anathemas bearing on persons and on formulas. The Lord's Spirit permits us to understand better today that the divisions brought about in this way were due in large part to misunderstandings. Whatever our Christological divergencies have been, we experience ourselves united today in the confession of the same faith in the Son of God who became man so that we might become children of God by his grace. We wish from now on to witness together to this faith in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, proclaiming it in appropriate ways to our contemporaries so that the world may believe in the gospel of salvation. This was really a very big deal indeed. After 1,500 years, they could confess that, um, that they understood the Nicene Creed in the same way. The two churches have continued on this path towards unity. And in 2001, another major stumbling block, the non-recognition by Rome of the validity of the Eucharist celebrated using a particular Eucharistic prayer known as the anaphora of Adai and Mari, that too was overcome. And so the result is that there is now very little in either doctrine or liturgy that still divides the Assyrian church and the corresponding Catholic Oriental church, the Chaldean church, uh, the Patriarchate of Babylon. The two churches now permit a certain degree of intercommunion. And when the current leader of the Assyrian church visited Pope Francis a few months ago, the Pope's words to him included a powerful statement of hope for the future of the Catholic church's ecumenical journey with the Assyrian church. He said, I dare to express a dream that the separation with the beloved Assyrian church of the East, the longest in the history of the church, can also be, please God, the first to be resolved. Amen. The other fruit, concrete fruit that I want to mention, I promise I'm getting near the end, is what's known uh, in, in the business as the, the JDDJ, the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification, a fruit of the Catholic Church's dialogue with the Lutheran World Federation, signed in 1999. Uh, so there you see the then uh, President of the Pontifical Council, Cardinal Edward Cassidy, and the then President of the World Lutheran Federation, his name I don't know, uh, signing that document. Uh, and then beside us, you have the uh, mem commemorative stone in the church where it was signed. While the question of justification might not be the most important priority for many Catholics, even Catholics who are interested and learned in theology, it is a huge issue in the history of the Reformation. And for the reformers, it perhaps was the biggest issue. How are believers justified? How do they come to be accepted by God? And how does this relate to the performance of good works? For centuries, Catholics and Lutherans have engaged in mutual condemnation, often based more on politics and rhetoric than on real theology. And so the JDDJ attempted to put all of this in context and to move beyond it. Together we confess, by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit, who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. The document goes on to confess many more things that Lutherans and Catholics can now uh, say together. Uh, but that, I think, the section I've just quoted is the heart of it. By grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we're accepted by God. It's a remarkable document, very subtle in its navigation of the unchangeable doctrinal commitments of the two traditions 
and their shared desire to move beyond the anathemas and condemnations uh, of the time. Even more remarkably, though the JDDJ was the work of Catholics and Lutherans, it has now been formally accepted and adopted by the World Methodist Council, the World Communion of Reformed Churches, and the Anglican Communion. And there you see a ceremony, and it's clearly in the church in Wittenberg, because uh, I recognize it, I think. Uh, and you see there, uh, I see the two, the leaders of the World Methodist Council, the leaders of, of the Reformed, and the man on the left is the recently appointed gen new General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. At the time, he was part, I think, of the World Reformed uh, group. The authorities of all five communions are now collaborating on taking this important work forward, beginning with a consultation in Notre Dame in 2019. And so the JDDJ partners are thus becoming an important multilateral ecumenical instrument of their own. The significance of what has been achieved in terms of breaking down barriers and centuries old walls of separation cannot be uh, overestimated. Uh, much of the sort of concrete fruit that uh, we have seen has been with uh, Eastern churches, churches that we still, that, that we, as I say, that, that we recognize as having uh, fully valid uh, sacraments and, or, and or orders and so on. So to have reached such a, an important level of agreement with, a, uh, with, with four other major communions uh, stemming from the West uh, is very significant. I'm conscious as I move towards the end that I am talking to you during the season of Lent when we are called in a particular way to conversion. Now is the favorable time. Uh, our title for today, the time is now, I think chimes with this very well. Of course, conversion can have negative overtones uh, in ecumenical contexts, reminding people of Christians who leave one church in order to join another. But I use the word here in the normal sense of examining one's heart, recognizing and repenting of one's sins and turning towards God afresh. Lent is we know, the season of conversion par excellence. But commitment to ecumenism is also an occasion for conversion. And indeed, it requires conversion in order to make that commitment. As Pope Francis put it in an address to a group of visiting Finnish Lutherans in 2019, true ecumenism is based on a shared conversion to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Redeemer. If we draw close to him, we draw close also to one another. So let us draw close to him, turn towards him and be saved. And I will close with a prayer of the Shema Nuf community, who is the, which is a Catholic, ecumenical, charismatic uh, community known in many places around the world now. This, part, this forms part of their daily prayer uh, every day of the year. Lord Jesus, who prayed that we might all be one, we pray to you for the unity of Christians according to your will, according to your means. May your spirit enable us to experience the suffering caused by division, to see our sin, and to hope beyond all hope. Amen. Amen. So maybe we could ask that we may all be converts. Thank you for your patience. Well, Brown, thank you very much for your time and for uh, your wisdom. I always enjoy listening to you, and I appreciate so much not only the history of the ecumenical movement you provided us, but also our hope for the future. We have uh, a few questions, if you've got a few moments. Um, sure. One of the questions, I think, which is a really practical one, um, and it kind of comes in two parts. The first one um, is that, you know, for... For many of us, when we go to uh, different Protestant churches, um, the table is open and we are welcomed uh, to share with them uh, from their end. We're, we're, of mm -hmm. course, not able to do that from our own end. Uh, but for Catholics, what do you think would be um, some of the key differences that we would need to overcome if we were to share the Eucharist together? Whoa, simple question then, eh? Um, uh, so it popped up on my screen, and I'm like, "Okay, I'll ask yeah. it." <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's well, of course, it's a, it's kind of it's where the rubber hits the road, I guess. So it's not surprising that people would ask the question. Um, 
we have made a lot of progress in the over the years with, with ma many of our partners in our understanding uh, of the Eucharist. Um, the the difficulty from the Catholic point of view uh, is that uh, Eucharist is is intimately tied up with uh, with church uh, with with a recognition that. Uh, a particular ecclesial body is a true church, that it has true sacraments, uh, that it has uh, true ministers, true ordained ministers. Um, we have not yet reached the point in our uh, dialogues with, with, with the various uh, Protestant churches where we're able to affirm uh, that they do have uh, valid, true uh, priesthoods and therefore sacraments. Um, we had made a lot of progress, I think, particularly with the Anglicans uh, for many years, and, and it was looking like we were very close to it. Uh, but then, of course, things overtook us, the uh, introduction of the ordination of women uh, in, in most uh, uh, ecclesial families of the West uh, has complicated the matter, the matter considerably. Um, some work has been done by another, and those of us who work in sort of official uh, ch church mandated dialogues um, can sometimes maybe not have as much uh, freedom to push at the edges, push the envelope a little bit as, as some of those in, in, who are involved in more um, in more independent work. And there's there's another actually dialogue um, group uh, of Catholics and Anglicans um, that is currently looking at the question of uh, Rome's non-recognition, for instance, of, of Anglican ordination. Uh, and trying to uh, put put that in context uh, of, of the changes that we've made in our understanding of the church uh, since Vatican II, and the fruit of our of our of the dialogue that have taken place, and and asking the question: Does this not put the question of uh, orders, valid sacraments, true reality of the church uh, into into new, new light? Um, the case for for saying that it does is convincing. Uh, but but Rome also has uh, a very strongly stated position uh, about presbyteral ordination being be not being possible for, uh, for for women. So that has sort of complicated, to put it mildly, uh, the situation wholly. Um, so so there's two there's two things why 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 Rome uh, doesn't allow, doesn't uh, allow. I know we all have we all have freedom if we if we choose to behave in a certain way. But that, that Rome does not uh, encourage Catholics uh, or permit Catholics to 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 share in communion uh, in Protestant churches. One is that uh, that uh, that we are not able to affirm uh, that the, that quotation from, from Vatican II, the the full reality of the Eucharistic mystery, mystery being being present. Uh, so that's one bit, and the second bit is that that to share in the Eucharist is a sign of to, to share in communion is a sign of communion, right. uh, and that unless we have resolved many many more issues, it isn't appropriate for us to share communion. So that's why the example I was giving of the uh, Assyrian Church of the East, because the ma major doctrinal issues have been have been effectively overcome. Uh, and the and the sacramental issues around around the, the liturgical formulas. Now, sharing in communion is possible in some circumstances, and with a view to actually being soon in in full communion, in full interchange, interchangeability uh, of ministries and so on. Um, we're not there in in in, in, in that position with, with most other with, with, with currently with any other. Uh, major major Christian family, um, and it is difficult because I even even answering it, I I, I get vaguely embarrassed saying things like we we don't recognise the presence of of, of uh, the, the Eucharistic mystery and, and and full reality of the sacramental life. Uh, it's not something that one likes saying, uh, yeah. and because of our dialogues, we've managed to move beyond it, sounding like a a, a nasty uh, condemnation. Uh, but the reality is that we haven't actually got to the stage where we can change that judgment yet. 
and there are those who say, well, how, how can we ever reach that, that that place now, particularly when, again, the question of, of women's ordination apply, applies. Someone say, well, that's it. We're never we're never going to be able to have, have unity. Um, I don't know. Um, unity is not something that we create. It, it is on one level, it is there already because, uh, as that Vatican mm -hmm. document said, uh, Christ founded one church, and we have to kind of discover that unity, and that's why we pray for Christian unity to to, to have the the that God's grace will somehow allow us to, to find ways. Uh, and when you see things that have uh, moved, like the progress on justification, uh, who knows? Uh, it's not our church, it's God's church. Uh, but certainly it is very painful and often embarrassing uh, that we can't, um, ex particularly when we do feel a, a huge level of, uh, of comfort, and of actual communion or fellowship uh, when we visit another church. Um, certainly that was my experience when I was a student in Durham. I was, I was living with these, with these Anglicans and Methodists. We were praying together three times a day. We were eating all meals together. Uh, so we felt like we had as good fellowship as, as you could possibly imagine. Uh, but, but the bodies that we belong to hadn't reached that same level. So it's, yeah, it's painful. A very honest answer, and I think you uh, you speak about the struggle that I think many of us who are engaged in this work often often feel. Oh, and if you didn't if you didn't feel a pain talking about it, it that would be wrong. That would be a problem too. <laughs> if it doesn't make you squirm, <laughs> um, uh, it should, uh, and it does, and certainly for many of us. Brother Martin, I want to be respectful of, um, of your time and of uh, those that will be watching this later. Um, maybe just one final question, and um, it's really looking to you for some advice. Is What do you think that we who are engaged in pastoral work, um, either formally or informally, can do to support ecumenical dialogue and to um, foster that oneness that Christ so ardently desires of uh, all of God's children? Mm. Well. Um, it sounds trite, but but go visit other Christians. Like I've been talking about institutional work, institutional dialogue. Um, what happens in local communities uh, is a different thing, uh, and there's enormous uh, scope. Um, there's a sort of a, an adage in the ecumenical world from dating from. Uh, uh, a meeting in Lund uh, more than 70 years ago, I think at this stage, about trying to, to do everything together that, to do everything together except that which conscience doesn't allow. Um, so particularly in, in, in rural areas where churches might be, might be far flung, uh, to cooperate on things, uh, to, to, to organize things like Lent groups, uh, study groups, uh, service projects together, but also, but not just service projects because um, I think it's important to, to always have the history prayer together involved somehow. And also, uh, if we're looking to, to discover unity, well, then we need to be praying together and reading the scriptures together. Um, and there is huge scope for that. Uh, um, interestingly, one of the projects that I'm also involved in uh, has, uh, it's an international commission, but it's chaired by two Canadians. Um, so apart from our official uh, theological dialogue with the Anglicans. There's another thing with a wonderful uh, acronym called IARCOM, which is the International Anglican Roman Catholic Commission on Unity and Mission. Um, and that tries to take all the theological stuff and make it hit the ground through cooperation. And so it involves pairs of bishops from around the world being commissioned. And there, and the, there was a, a gathering in 2016 and the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury commissioned them together to go out, to be sent out in pairs, very biblical, uh, to, to witness to unity by doing things together. Um, and so we're due to have another one of those uh, in, in 2024, um, where, because some of them have moved on, some have retired, some have died, so there's a whole new, new set of people to be, uh, where we, again, we'll, we'll hope to send them out. Now that's kind of formal, and it's been it's led very wonderfully by the Archbishop of Regina, uh, Don Bolan, and uh, an Ancan Bishop in England who's originally Canadian called David Hamid. Um, but that's the international level. That model can happen in every town and every region in the world if if there's a will. Archbishop Boland is one of our uh, one of our heroes on this side of the pond. 
So it's uh, great he's, to hear he's, about the work he's, that he's, he's doing. He's a good hero. He, he was actually in this job uh, 20 years ago. Uh, he, 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 he was in this job in Rome for, for a number of years, and he's still very much involved in any medical work, and as I said, chairs this commission. And uh, yeah, he's a great man. <laughs> well, you know, you, you've spoken so well about um, the scandal that uh, the vision the Christian community has, has brought about in the world and how our division has um, left us living in such a way that we are uh, hampering the fullness of God's reign being known by all people. But I think you've, you've given us incredible hope in um, not only speaking about the rich history that I think so many of us are unaware of, but also about some of the concrete things that have come out in our dialogues with say the Assyrian Church of the East mm -hmm. or with the uh, Worldwide Lutheran Federation or even some of the smaller ways that we're able to simply sit down over tea and coffee and share our faith in Christ Jesus. Mm. So for the, uh, the big things that you were doing to foster unity and the small things, we offer our thanks and our prayerful support. Uh, we ask you to pray for us as well. And we uh, thank you today very much for your time. We're also very grateful pleasure. today for the many people that are um, going to be watching this uh, later. We are interested in, uh, of course, your feedback and engagement. And we just encourage if you've got any concerns or if you are looking to develop something in your parish or if you're looking to further the dialogue, please give uh, me a call or send me an email at springbankcatholic.ca. So again, thank you, Father Brown. Thank you, those that are uh, with us today. And thank you uh, to all those that will be joining us in the future. Many blessings. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.